Hallelujah. Praise God. You got your word with you today? It's sold up. It says God's word. It is truth, and I believe it. This is God's will for my life. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And because I believe the word, I can do the same things Jesus did. And I've been redeemed to receive blessings. And my God shall supply all my need according to the glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And I've been ordained to bear fruit. Therefore, I press forward for the prize of the high calling that God has for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, last week, I, I woke up on Sunday morning and... Uh, Hallelujah, glad that's just kids living. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I woke up last Monday morning and all of a sudden God was dealing with me and I had, I got up and began to pray and study and I started going, I had two sermons going Monday morning already. <laughs> I said, Whoa, God! <laughs> What's going on? Of course, I had that. I had that uh, school that I did yesterday, uh, Friday night and Saturday, over in Houston. So uh, it was good that I had this done. But one thing that's really kind of dangerous for y'all is when I get started early on a sermon. Because by the time Sunday comes around, I've had a lot of time to think, to talk to God about it, to get more scriptures and more scriptures and more scriptures. And so hopefully we get this done in one day. Turn with me to... Ephesians, the second chapter, and the 18th verse. Ephesians 2, 18, and it says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your spirit, and I ask you today that you... Your spirit would use me to teach. Holy Ghost, you're the greatest teacher in all the world, and so uh, please teach us today and anoint our ears to hear that we may able to be able to know and understand what you're saying to us today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have access by one spirit to the Father. How does that happen? John, the 14th chapter. And, and what I got on this, it was, it was really wild because both of these messages that the Lord was giving me, was, I was working on both of them at the same time and everything. And, and so I'm, I'm praying that this will, you'll be able to understand this. But I titled it, Follow the Spirit. Follow the Spirit, okay? We're talking about Spirit of God here. John, the 14th chapter, the 12th verse says, Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 15th verse says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
Amen? I will not leave you orphans. I'll come to you. A little while longer in this world will see you no more, will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, the 15th chapter of John and the 26th verse says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So we have access by one Spirit, to the Father, okay? It's because of, it says, and we look at that Ephesians 2, 18, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father, meaning through Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did by dying on the cross for us, through him and the fact that he died on the cross and went back to the Father in heaven and was able then to send the Holy Spirit, which he promised there in John the 14th chapter, he said, I will send you another helper. And that helper is the spirit of truth. And you'll know him and he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, Jesus and John, Jesus, when he was teaching here, he hadn't died yet. So the Holy Spirit hadn't been released on the earth yet. That's why he said, will be in you. Okay, but today is different. We don't need the will be. Today, we have the he is. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, so when the helper comes, this is what it, the reason that we can have access to the Father through the Spirit is because Jesus Christ died on the cross and, re, and went back to the Father and released the Holy Spirit upon the earth to stay upon the earth, you know? So when did that happen? Well, I want, us to, I want us to look at some things. I want us to look at a process of that release of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus resurrected from the grave and he was bodily resurrected, and he went to heaven, okay? He went to heaven. He sprinkled his blood on the altar in heaven to pay the sacrifice for all of us so that we may have life, we may live, may be, be made alive in him, amen? But then if we look in John, the 20th chapter, and the 19th verse, I'm going to start there, and it says, then the same day at evening, this is, Resurrection Sunday. On Resurrection Sunday, he's talking about the same day because they just talked about his, what happened at the tomb. Okay, so it says, In the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this was not the release of the Holy Spirit upon the earth as he is today. What this was, whenever this is where these disciples of Jesus were born again. Okay, this is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. That came later in this process. This is when they became born again. He breathed on them, and the Spirit of God came within them. It's the same thing that happened with Adam. When God created Adam, he was a hunk of clay. And he breathed the breath of life into him, and he became a living soul. You all remember that? Say, well, this is what happened again. These men were dead in their sins and trespasses, even as we were before Christ. And what Jesus did, he breathed on them, and they became a living 
person. They became, their spirits became alive. He made them alive. Just as we, when we accepted Jesus Christ and we asked him to come in, he breathed breath of life into us and we became alive. We were made alive. See, and so I'm, I'm, we're looking at this process. See, he, he breathed in. Here's what I want you to understand. He breathed life into them. You want to just really understand salvation by faith alone? These men really never even had much faith, did they? Because where were they? They was hiding out, afraid of the Jews. But they was the ones that Jesus had trained in for three and a half years, and he came to them, and he breathed on them. He gave them a gift of life. They sure didn't work for it, did they? They didn't work for it. Uh -uh. They was hiding behind locked doors in fear. And yet Jesus came in and gave them life. See, that's what I say. When we believe, see, how, what, what did he say? It says here, he came into the room, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. In other words, they recognized who Jesus was, and they recognized what he did. He had resurrected from the grave. It truly was him. What did you do? Whenever you responded to the Holy Spirit, what did you do? You recognized that he was who he was, and you recognized what he did. He died and was resurrected, and now he's given me life. See, same, same process here, okay? Now, anyone, here's what I was saying, that this is not, this is not the day of Pentecost yet. Anyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has went through this process right here in John 20. They went through it, and they have the Spirit of God. Okay? So that's why some denominations, when you say, you know, have you got the Spirit of God? You know, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are you this or that? They'll get confused with this. Say, yeah, praise God, I got Jesus. I got the Spirit of God in me. Hallelujah. And they're not understanding what we're going to talk about a little bit later here. And so what I want us to understand, anybody, anybody who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are born again has the Spirit of God in them. Okay? I realize this is kind of elementary to a lot of you. But I'm just wanting it out, wanting you to see something. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I, I, I'm taking you on a process here. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is where? In Christ. What Jesus say up above there, he said, whenever we was talking a while ago, in, in John, he said, uh, and that day you'll know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Any man who is in Christ is a new creation. In Christ means someone who is born again, and we're in him, and he's in us. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay? Are become new. But look, four verses later, 521, for he, meaning God, made him, meaning Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness is number 1343 in your concordance, and it's 
decaiu se <laughs> decaiu se ne decaiu se ne something like that okay it's greek okay it means equity of character or act i believe john was talking about that this morning that we need to act like we talk we don't need to just talk the talk but walk the talk the equity of character or act is specifically christian justification just as if we'd never sinned. See, when's that happen? It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are become, you've heard me say it before, are is present tense, become is future tense. So in one verb, they got present tense and future tense together. So you have to break it apart. Things are new. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you immediately were born again. And get this, immediately you are righteous. If it wasn't an immediate thing, then it would have to be something that we worked for. And folks, let me tell you something. If you're anything like me, you ain't good enough. <laughs> okay? See, so this, whenever we accepted Christ, we became righteous just then because, see, we're made righteous. Righteous means in right standing with God. Okay, means we are in right standing with Him. We're done we're, that we're made righteous by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not of ourselves; it's a gift from God. See, because Jesus became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. See, we don't want to anybody who thinks they have to work to be righteous, has self-righteousness. And the Bible says, <laughs> not me. <laughs> I don't want that self-righteousness. You say, I, want, I, I, I am righteous only because of what he did. Amen. Amen? Amen? And so, but let's look at the Old Testament. We're talking about righteousness, and I'm going to try to bring us all around to following the Spirit. Let's look in the Old Testament. Isaiah 59, the 16th verse. Isaiah 59, 16, and I'm reading out of the Amplified on this verse. And here's what I want you to see. Isaiah 59, 16, the Amplified verse. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor, no one to intervene on behalf of truth and right. Therefore, his own arm brought him victory and his own righteousness, having the spirit without measure, sustained him. You got the Amplified up here? Huh? It's not working anymore? Well, it's not good. But it says in the Amplified where it says, and his own righteousness, right after that comma, it's got brackets, having the spirit without measure. I want you to see that. See, because Jesus Christ had the spirit without measure. He was righteous. It says his own righteousness having the spirit without measure sustained him okay now here's what i want you to look at the bible said remember we said the spirit of god came within us and we became the righteousness of god but it says here, and his own righteousness. 
sustained him. See, here's what I want you to. There's a difference, but there is no difference. (laughs) If you can figure this out. There is a difference, but there's no difference between what Jesus had, his own righteousness, and what we have, the righteousness of God. There's no difference in the righteousness, but there's a difference in how we acquired it. It was Jesus' own righteousness. He was God. But because he died for us and paid the price for our sin, and we didn't have to die, he paid the penalty for it, and then he gave us the gift of righteousness. When he made us alive, he did not make junk. Amen? When he made us alive, he made us righteous. Amen? See, and so therefore, here's what I want you to understand. Therefore, there should be no one, no one to ever think that they are holier than someone else. You ever seen someone like that that acts like that? You know, strutting around thinking they're holier than everybody else, putting people down and this and that and everything else. Folks, we should never be that way. Why? Because we are nothing but filthy rags without Jesus. Amen? Amen. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, it says. But it says he took off off of us the filthy rags and clothed us with the robe of righteousness. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory to God. See, so what he's talking about there is that that righteousness, there's no difference in the righteousness of what God had, his own righteousness, and what we have is just how we got it. Amen? And see, 1 John 2.20 says, you, how many is that talk? Who's that talk to? Huh? Is that you? Is that you? See, y'all, but y'all have an anointing from the Holy One. <laughs> and you know all things. See, and John, 1 John 2.27 says that that anointing which you receive from him abides in you. That's that Spirit of God, isn't it? The Spirit of God that abides in you. That's that anointing. That's that anointing that says, oh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And you've heard me say before, which is not a personal pronoun, but which is talking about a thing. The thing that it's talking about, Christ, is the title that Jesus had. Jesus Christ. Jesus, the anointed one. So he's saying through that anointing of the Holy Spirit that abides in us, stays in us, lives in us, has taken up residence in us, we can do all things. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Luke 24. Luke 24. See, now Jesus, when as soon as he resurrected, he went into the upper room and he breathed on them. They became a living soul. They became, they became made alive. So then what did he do? Did he go back to heaven? No, he hung around for about 40 days teaching them, okay? And just before he was ready to leave in Luke 24, 49, did we find that one yet? Luke 24, 49, did I tell you that? Let's go to Luke 24, 46 then, okay? Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts was written by Luke also, and Luke took off in the book of Acts just right where he left off in the, in the gospel of Luke. And Acts 1, 4, 8, 4 through 8 says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from, a, from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. See, it's the same thing he said in Luke 24. So Luke just take, carrying on with this story here. He says, Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then skip to the eighth verse. It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. See, so here, here's this process. He died on the cross for us was buried, bodily resurrected, went to heaven, sprinkled his blood on the altar, came back that evening into the upper room where the disciples were uh, for fear of the other Jews, and he breathed on them, and they were born again. And then he began to teach them, and he taught them for 40 days. And what he was teaching them was what they needed. But, I mean, he, he told them just before he left, now you stick around here. Don't even go out and try to minister any of the stuff I've told you until you get the power from on high. So it's so important. It's so important that we receive that power. And so he says then, he says, then he comes in and acts. It says, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you'll receive power. That's that promise of the Father. He has promised us this. Acts 2, the first verse, when the day of Pentecost had fun, fun, fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? There's been a whole lot of different theories of what happened at this time. A lot of denominations said they began to speak in languages that they did not know, but the other 13 groups of people there did know. I don't believe that. They began to speak in a prayer language. Because, see, now there's 120 people in this upper room. And 120 people had something happen to them, and they spilled out onto the streets. Now, if they would have just come out onto the street and, you know, and Maribel's speaking Spanish and he's speaking Greek and he's speaking Hebrew and, 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 and she's over here in Latvia or somewhere, you know, and, and she's speaking that, would they have said, these guys are drunk? They wouldn't have said that, would they? No, they'd said, whoa, whoa, man, you all talk in different languages. I can't understand what you're saying. But see, there would have been a group of people over here that would have understood what Billy was saying. Some of them over here would have understood what she was saying. Some of them would have understood what they're saying over here. But no, they said, man, these people are drunk. They're babbling. You know, they're out there, and they just... They can't understand a word their people are saying. Why? Because they're praying in a prayer language that the Holy Spirit has given them. The Holy Spirit on the inside has given them, and the Holy Spirit has come upon them. 
See? Here's what I want you to understand. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the same as being born again. How many of you have been water baptized? Let me see them fingers somewhere. Anybody not got their hand up, I'll grab them. <laughs> Run the water, Billy. <laughs> We're going to get them. <laughs> but see, let me ask you this question. What is it that I tell you to do when you get water baptized? What is it? Grab this elbow and grab your nose. Why? Because I'm going to put you under the water and you're not there to get a drink. <laughs> you know? When you got water baptized, how much water did you drink? How much water went into you? None. See? It was on the outside. But whenever we got born again and he breathed life into us, it came into us. See, so the Spirit of God lives in every Christian that there is. But not everybody has the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit comes upon them and enables them to speak in a prayer language and enables them to have the power to be a witness all over the world. See, not everybody has that. Jesus wanted them all to have it. And Paul said, I wish you all spoke in tongues. See? So, on the day of Pentecost, he, what was it that Jesus said? I'm going to send someone to help you. I'm going to send somebody to help you. He says, when that helper, the spirit of truth, comes along, you're going to get power to be able to do some things that you couldn't do before. You're going to be able to do some of those things that Kyle was talking about up here. You have to do something that you're not normally doing. But see, it's the power of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that can enable you to do all things. Amen? See, here's what happened. Now, now the process goes on. The process goes on. Let's go to Acts 2.36. Now here, I want you to remember, 120, well, no, first off, there was 12 people, 11 people. I think it was probably just the 11 disciples up there in that room with the locked doors where Jesus came in. Okay. But then 40 days later after, and you got to understand what happens here. Jesus was teaching, and there was a whole bunch of people out there. It says he appeared to 500 people. So he was obviously teaching to about 500 people for about 40 days, and he told them, he said, y'all go up there and you wait for the Holy Ghost, and there's only 120 of them. 120 in the upper room on that day of Pentecost. So, these 120 got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Where was Peter on Resurrection Sunday evening? Peter was locked in a room for fear of the Jews, wasn't he? Amen? Well, what happened after... The baptism of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. They fell out into the streets, tumbled out there into the streets. Everybody thought they was drunk. And he, he says, oh, no, 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 man. These are not, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And then he begins to talk to them. And he begins to give them a, a message. He begins to preach to them. He begins to tell them about Jesus Christ and what you have done. And in the 36th verse of Acts 2, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, the rest of these men who were hiding in fear before, said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, I like the first message. I like the first word to come out. Repent. Folks, that is still true today. Why? What was they saying? They were saying, Jesus, Peter was preaching a message, and he's saying, boys, you screwed up. <laughs> you, you crucified this man. And, and, and they're saying, what can we do? What did they mean by that? What can we do to get in right standing with God? That's what they was wanting to do, wasn't it? That's what he said, just told them. You crucified him, and God made him Lord and King. And they said, oh, what must we do in order to get back in right standing with God? And he said, repent. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as our Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and gladly received and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Would that be available today? Would that be applicable today? Absolutely. Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. In Acts 4, after a couple of them had been arrested, they prayed, Lord, give us boldness to speak the word of God see it's interesting because from resurrection Sunday evening to the day of Pentecost it sounds like Peter had gotten a big old dose of boldness hadn't he through the baptism of the Holy Ghost he received the power to do what he had to do amen now here's the problem a lot of churches and a lot of denominations today say that whenever Peter and all the apostles died out, all that stuff stopped. They are called cessationists. C-E-S-S-A-T-I-O-N-S-I-S-T. -S -S cessationists, not sensationalists, but cess, meaning they ceased, Okay. Well, it didn't end with the first apostles, folks. 1 Corinthians 2, first verse. I've been going fast because I'm, I'm just trying to get this out to you today. I got five pages, and I'm on just three. So we're, gonna, we're about halfway done, folks. It didn't end with the first apostles. 1 Corinthians 2, the first verse. And I, brethren, when I came to you, this is Paul writing, okay? Did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What's he saying? This is Paul, who wasn't even a follower of Jesus when Jesus was alive. He was not a believer in the way, even after Jesus resurrected. He was the one who went around gathering up people who were in the way. That's what they called it back, you know, the way. That's the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And so, but, and 
he would gather them up and take them back to the authorities so they could be killed. He was a murderer. But on the road to Damascus, God appeared to him, Jesus appeared to him, and uh, began to speak to him, and, and then his whole life changed. And then he became a follower. And then he became, after years alone with the Lord, and, you know, with God and being, you know, what he had to do, he became the apostle to the Gentiles. And he began, and he said, I didn't come with persuasive words. I came with a demonstration of the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see that the, these miracles and all this power of the Holy Spirit didn't stop with the apostles. 1 Corinthians 13. Here's another argument that is used all the time. 1 Corinthians 13, the 8th verse, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, Denominations will tell you, do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe that the Bible is without error? It is the inerrant word of God? And, of course, what are you going to say? Yeah, I believe that. So you believe the Bible is perfect. So when the perfect Bible came along and was canonized in the 300s, okay, that's, then that's whenever all that other stuff stops. All those prophecies, all that stuff, all that stopped. That's what they say. They just refuse to read the whole thing. The 10th verse, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, this is Paul saying, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Let me tell you, let me ask you a question. The Bible is the inerrant word of God. I believe that. No error in the Bible. Do you know all things? No? Well, he said, Paul said, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. What's the perfect that he's talking about when he comes? The perfect, when perfect, that which is perfect comes, it's talking about when Jesus Christ comes back for his church. Because Jesus is the only one who is perfect. Amen. And when Jesus comes back, then we shall know even as we are known. You are not going to have to study the Bible when you get to heaven. Because you will see God face to to face that's what the bible says and you will know even as you are known does god know everything about you <laughs> yeah unfortunately he does huh? <laughs> we can't hide anything from him and it says at that time we will know even as we are known so we will have knowledge We will know even as we are known. We are known now fully, aren't we? We will know fully then. We will not know in part, but we'll know fully. How many of you have ever said or heard someone say, I'll tell you what, when I get to heaven, I got some questions I want answered. 
Well, guess what? You're not going to have to ask those questions. <laughs> Boom, you're just going to know it, you know? <laughs> Hallelujah. You won't have to stand around for two or three years asking questions of Moses, you know, and Noah and all them guys, you know? We won't have to figure out how he built that ark. We'll know. Hallelujah. So, so here's, I've been trying to, 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 to been trying to, to show you that how God has brought us to a point. He's brought us to a point and he's equipped us magnificently. Be ready to follow the Spirit. You have the Spirit. You have the Spirit, don't you? Have the Spirit on the inside, got the Spirit on the outside. John, the third chapter. John, the third chapter. We're going to read this. This is the story where Jesus was teaching Nicodemus. This is the story where Nicodemus came to him. He's a ruler of the Jews. And, and he came to him, and he's, he's asking him questions. He said, what must I do, you know? As he put that first question, he says, uh, we know you're a teacher. No one comes. You do. Okay. Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he goes into, how can I do that? How can I, you know, how can I be born again? I can't get back up my mother's womb. He said, you must be born of water and spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. Okay? Now we know the water, being born of water is our natural birth when the water breaks, and being born of, of the spirit is whenever we're born again. But the seventh verse says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Eighth verse, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What's that saying to you? What's that saying to you? Let me just put it this way. If you think you have your whole life planned out and you know what you're going to do next, then you are not following the Spirit. Now, if you have a plan, we all have to have a plan, you know, we have a plan, you know, uh, and, and we need to, I, I just I just pray you all come to Dave Ramsey, okay, you need to have a plan, he gives us a plan, if I'd have had a plan, see, let me tell you just something, just a little personal thing about me, when I first became a Christian back up in Indiana, and I was, man, I was just, shoo, buddy, yeah, right, let's go, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and I had a man come to my house wanting me to sell me insurance on my kids so that I could begin to put money away so they could have a college education. You know what I told him? My boy was two years old, and I said, you know what? I don't even think we're going to be here that long. I think Jesus is coming back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I didn't do it. You know? <laughs> See, a lot of us Christians get that way, don't we? Oh, we get super spiritual, you know? No, we need to make a plan. But you, you know what my saying is? Make a plan and be flexible. Yeah. See? Because you never know when it's coming. The Holy Ghost is liable to just blow right in on you. And all of a sudden, he says, I want you to go do this. I, I, no, God, I, I, I'll do that tomorrow, okay? I got to do this today. Boom, you just lost a miracle. You just lost seeing God move in some situation, whether it been for your life or somebody else's life, but you just missed it because you were not ready to follow the Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, folks. God's not going to come over when you're working and you're in the middle of something. Say, okay, I want you to quit this, and I want you to go over here and do this. Your boss might, but, <laughs> but God does it, you know. But see, now he, so 
God's not going to cause you to lose your job. You understand what I'm trying to say? You know, but he's liable to talk to you while you're at work for your assignment on the way home from work. Maybe he's telling you, I want you to go down to Joe B's on the way home. But I got vegetables already, God. I don't need more vegetables. I don't need to go to Joe B's. He says, I want you to go to Joe B's. It's not about you, and it's not about the vegetables. It's about following the Spirit of God and seeing a miraculous thing happen because it's God-ordained. That's what it's about. See? And so, I just use Joe B. as an example. God may send you somewhere else. Huh? <laughs> I've seen miracles happen in Home Depot. Amen? <laughs> so, Hallelujah. Now, here's what I want you to understand. What do we say about Jesus while going to Isaiah 59? It says, his own righteousness, having the spirit without measure, sustained him. Okay? Go with me to John 3, 34. This is where we're going to bring it home, folks. John 3, 34. No, we're going to bring it home here, not go home. <laughs> John 3:34 It says, "For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure." Now people will argue with you that it says and he the he is capitalized, right? In your Bible, it's capitalized, right? So they will argue with you and say, well, that's Jesus, and he had the Spirit without measure. That is true. But I want you to understand something. Go with me to Matthew 28. Keep that in mind. He whom God sends... Speaks the word of God, for God does not give the spirit. He gives the, he, he does give the he does not give the spirit by measure. I have a couple of translations say that differently, but the God does not give the spirit by measure, okay? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Matthew, Mark 16. Mark 16, the 15th verse says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Romans 10, 13 and 15 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they hear, call on him in whom they have not believed? And how, th how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? It sounds like to me that we have been sent. Amen? Therefore, he whom God sends speaks the word of God and has the measure, has the spirit of God without measure. Don't tell me, well, Jesus had more anointing than I do. Oh, don't tell me, well, I'm not Jesus. That was Jesus. Do you believe it whenever Jesus said, I've got all authority, now go out and make disciples? Do you believe it? And he said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. If he's saying to me, and I'm sitting there in that chair, and, 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 and okay, we'll just, do a, we'll just do a real modern example, okay? A while ago, I had something that needed to be locked up at the church in my office. Mike has a key to my office. He has a key to my, he knows where, how to get in my file cabinet and lock things away. I came over and gave it to Mike, and I sent him to take it downstairs. I asked him to, but, you know, but 
But then by asking him to do it, I sent him down to do a job. He was sent to do a job, wasn't he? Can you all agree with that? Have we not been sent by God to do a job? And he whom God sends has the spirit without measure. You starting to understand this? See, the next time, whenever the Holy Spirit nudges you to do something, don't say, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that or not. You know, don't say, well, I don't know if I've got enough anointing for that. You've got the Spirit of God without measure, and you've got, glory to God, you've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the power to be a witness. Go do something. Allow the Holy Spirit to manifest through you. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, the fourth verse. There's diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to whom? Each one of you. Not John and Michael and Ricky and the rest of you just, sorry. No. No. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us Christians because he's writing to Christians. And he says it's for the profit of all. He didn't give us the manifestations of the Holy Spirit to profit us. It will profit you, but it's for everybody else. It's for you to give away. Now, what do you do? What is that manifestation? One is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Not as we will, but as he wills. That is what it's all about. You have to be willing to follow the Spirit. Because whenever, we don't know when it's going to come. We don't know where it's coming from. You ever heard the term, you know, man, he blindsided me on that one? <laughs> the Holy Ghost is good at that. <laughs> you know. And, and you don't know now, you don't know where he's going. Now, he'll tell you when he comes, he'll tell you, go do this and go do that. But he distributes it. And here's the thing. I want you to understand, you have the Spirit without measure. You got all the Holy Spirit. Amen? We got it all without measure. He gave it to us, poured it in, washed us in it. And you say, yeah, but, you know, Brother Ricky's the only one we see miracles with, you know. That's the only one, you know, Brother Ricky can make him do the miracles. I beg to differ. I beg, to, and I, I know I've talked to you about the different gifts and the different ministries and stuff like that, that those, those things happen more often and stuff like that. But that's because he, the Holy Spirit, and God said, okay, we're going to gift Ricky with this, and these are the things that happen in that gifting. But he said, but... I, but I give you all the Spirit without measure. And if you allow me, if you allow me to use you, 
and allow me to determine what needs to be done and you just allow me to work through you, I will use you to raise the dead to working of miracles, to discernment of spirits, to free, uh, prophecy and wisdom and knowledge. He'll use you in any of those things. You all can raise the dead. There is not a born-again Christian that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost if they are willing to follow the Spirit. There's none of them that can't raise the dead. Why? Because it's not us that does it. It's not us. It's not Brother Ricky that does these miracles. He's out there in California seeing miracles happening out there right now. Y'all be praying for him. Meeting. I think it might be over, but <laughs> you're going to Arizona next. Keep praying for him. Okay. <laughs> but do you all understand what I'm trying to say? Do you understand that you can raise the dead if the Holy Spirit decides to use you? That's what I'm trying to get you to understand, to follow the Spirit. Because the Spirit wants to do some very miraculous things, awesome things. And we can't do those things unless we're following the Spirit. Because how much of the Holy Spirit do you have? Without measure. That's right. Just think about that. Think about the next time. Think about how much of the Holy Spirit you have the next time you start to say, I can't do that. The Bible, says, <laughs> it's coming. the Bible says to agree with your adversary quickly. For otherwise, on the way to the court, he's allowed to throw you in jail. See? Well, here's what you need to do. The next time you start to say, I can't do that, agree with your adversary because you are the adversary. See, you're right, I can't, but the Holy Ghost can. Hallelujah, let's do it. Amen. <laughs> Amen? See? <laughs> well, first, first, one needs to be saved. And let me tell you something. The message, the message that was preached on the day of Pentecost, that where people say that's where the church was birthed and the church, well, it just, no, it wasn't. But anyway, well, that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> The first word when they said, what must I do to get in right standing with God? The very first word, repent. That message is still true today. Okay? Repent and receive Jesus. If you've walked away from God, repent and come back. Amen? Then you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now you need to follow and allow Holy Spirit to manifest through you. Amen? So I'm going to ask today, and I think just about everybody in here, is everybody in here has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You all accepted Christ? Both you girls born again? If not, would you like to? Okay. Is there anyone in here that has feel like you've walked away from God, you've broken fellowship with God, and you'd like to get back in right standing with God? If there is, come up. We'll pray with you. If there's anybody in here that does not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues and the power thereof, and you would like to have that, come on up here. We'll pray with you. Lord, you all are just a perfect church, ain't you? I'm going to have to leave before I mess you all up. <laughs> Any, is, there, is there anybody that, I know it's a silly question, anybody that needs healing today? Maybe you might need some healing. 
Well, we are just so glorious, ain't we? Anybody that has fear, you need cast out of you. <laughs> You're afraid to come up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Come on, prayer team. Come on. Hallelujah.